The second important uh, distinction I want to make, which is not always made, is services versus servers. This process isolation and always that we talked about is valid for servers as well. Okay. And what is the distinction between a service and a server? So I want you to think of service as a logical entity. Okay. Uh, it may or may not be comprised of multiple servers, uh, but it is one layer of incomplete abstraction. So think of it like say uh, SMS notification service. Now it can be implemented as one server, multiple servers, we end up load balancer. The, the configuration can be very different in different scenarios. Uh, but it is one logical entity as far as the user is concerned. Secondly, a service can be comprised of sub services. Like it need not be one process or even a cellular process. A service can be grouped into multiple sets of services with one main uh, orchestrator calling these sub services as well. But from the external user point of view, all these together are one uh, service. Uh, services typically are multi server or multi node or whatever you call it for fault tolerance, but that also means that the expectation of reliability from the service is completely different from that uh, compared to a server. I mean, in today's world of cloud computing and stuff, we always expect servers to go down. Okay? Entire data centers go down. Uh, there are Amazon out there, you are out there, you are Google Cloud. So, at a server level, we expect that uh, the entire mode might go down. But at a service level, the expectation of reliability is very high. Okay? So, even if one part of Amazon goes down, Dropbox can also go down, for example. So, as a service, Dropbox has a much higher uh, and different characteristics of reliability. These are uh, the One another important distinction I want to make is this was my first uh, definition of service oriented architecture on the first project that I worked on. Which means that uh, typically what we call MDC, right? model view and controller. To imagine these model views and controllers and any other abstractions you want to make are. Imagine that we are housed in different processes. Like typically, when we say model view controller, it's just one process and there are different logical layers of isolation. But imagine that each of these layers is a separate process. Then you have a data access service, you will have a presentation service, you will have uh, a controller service, and so on. Uh, that was the architecture that I worked on a long time ago. Uh, today, this is not what I'm going to be talking about. This kind of layering and distinction uh, is not really what the way modern service oriented architecture is. What we are going to talk about is isolation along function points. Now, what do I mean by function points? These are direct use cases of your problem. So, to give an example, you will have something like a question service, a reply service, something that directly maps to some functionality of your problem. In that completely isolated out, that is the kind of service architecture we are talking about. So, we are talking about maybe SMS notification service, we are talking about uh, uh, IP to geolocation service, okay. we are talking about mail service, we are talking about internal messaging service. Maybe messaging is part of your product, but that entire functionality is handled in the back end by some other service. Okay. So, uh, Isolation among function points uh, is what we have to think about, uh, at least in the context of this one. Now, one big question is why? So why do go for service oriented architecture? What are the benefits? Uh, has anyone of you worked on any uh, architecture where there have been isolation along function points? Instead of one big model So uh, there are two main advantages. I mean people have written entire books about why service oriented architecture and but 
to me it's finally going to turn to two points. The first is a software problem, and that is you get function point scalability, which means that you have often seen that this is required a big application, which has a lot of functionality. Now there are certain core uh, parts. There are certain core parts which. There are certain code parts in an application which are exercised more than the others. So the throughput or uh, the load in those code class may be part, maybe certain uh, endpoints in a HTTP application or any any such thing. They are exercised more than the others, and because it's one big application, a high load on these endpoints brings down the entire application. Right? You see that very often. Uh, Many times I've seen where a particular server was not, or service was not performing uh, up to its expected load. Uh, I could often isolate one or two endpoints which were being loaded the most. If those endpoints were moved out of the big application and moved into their own processes, they could be scaled independently. They could throw multiple machines at just those two endpoints, and the application would scale. You don't need to just like, deploy your application, your entire application. So, from a software perspective, uh, the problem that service oriented architecture solves is function point scalability. But building software is not just about technology. Uh, as most of us know, uh, more than, I would say more than 50% of it is actually a people problem. What service oriented architectures allow you to do? Is structure your team so that it can be managed a lot better from a product management perspective. Okay. There is, if you assign one particular team to one particular service end to end, right, that, that team is responsible for maintaining, building, deploying everything regarding that service. There will be one team responsible for that. Okay. If something does not work, you know who to go to to get it fixed. Okay? And that is a very important thing to have in a pretty large team. Very often I've seen that teams uh, have a lot of touch points with each other, even sub teams within a large team have a lot of touch points. And in case there is an issue, a lot of time is spent in figuring out who's going to solve this. Then there's a meeting call, two people from each team come together and they do something to solve the problem and so on. But if you have clean separation of uh, responsibilities, then every team can go its own way. Uh, so that doesn't mean they can do anything. Uh, they have to adhere to very different interfaces that what services are also. Okay. But it's much easier to, like, from a manager perspective, it's very easy to put the way And that's finally. Handling failures is uh, in a production system or in a, in a running system when the code has been deployed. Handling failures takes up most of it. So, having said that, let's uh, start looking into what service oriented architectures are made of. Like, need the layer. Uh, there are some fundamental axioms of these architectures which uh, take a look at these. The next Few slides that I'm going to show are probably the most important slides in this talk. We are going to need a foundation of what I'm going to build upon later. So, if you need to get up stretch, you can do But uh, if you have any questions in the next few slides, if you do, immediately stop me and get the questions back. So, the, the most fundamental axiom is that. Uh, is the asynchronous message. Basically, one component passing a message to another. Okay. That's where we start. Everything is going to be built on top of that. So, let's see what we mean by that. So, let's say you have a web server, the latest full application, uh, the latest social, what the word is, social is very important. With the uh, with the social. Latest social analytics platform. I don't know what that means, but it's a good thing. 
okay, and you are going to onboard a particular user. Now, this web application is backed by uh, uh, IDVMS. Uh, you are taking these so transactions, so the relational guarantee has been perfectly. So, you decide to go with the relational database. So, when I say that green box over there, that is the entire service. It is the database plus your application on how many of the Let's say user signs up and uh, you onboard that user. In an async model, what you do is you send out a signal, say user is added. Okay. Who can, what that signal, uh, who this signal goes to, and we'll see later. But fundamentally, you send out a signal or a message saying that the user is added. Okay. Who is at the other end of the signal? Who is receiving the signal? Listener. Right? So, if you have a web application and if you are thinking of the async model, uh, what do you expect from the listeners? Some response. So, that is the one thing that uh, I need to drive home right now. We are talking of the async model, which means that the sender has no idea and does not care about the receivers. <coughs> it, it's just a message that is being broadcasted. Okay, even if there are no listeners out there, the sender will still send the message. The sender has absolutely no idea even of the existence of any listeners. That is the basic design criteria behind this model that we are talking about. Okay. Now, let's say that we do have some listeners because we are talking about microservice architecture. So Let's say you have these slots which are SMS notifiers and email notifiers. So let's say you uh, the user is added, you send him a confirmation SMS, and the one service which is going to send an email. So these services will receive those messages when they are sent and do whatever they have to and actually send the payload to the SMSs and the emails. Okay. So fast forward you package this application where you have like one more year. Email notifier running on another day of SMS notifier running, you have a right application running. Maybe there's a hypothetical page which connects the published message to the messages that are made. Now you require this application and your product manager comes in uh, in a few days and says, Hey, you know, we use, uh, you, we are using Facebook app to onboard the user to sign up to authenticate. Which means we have access to the user's Facebook friends. Do you want a feature where we are going to check who that user's Facebook friends are? And if they are also on our system, we are going to send them push notifications. That way, this guy who is on Facebook or who is a friend of mine on Facebook has just joined our Facebook application. So, I want this done in one week, next three. What do you do in a typical application? Go and put it in whatever. In this architecture, because of the In our, our architecture, all you need to do is add in another service which sends out push notifications. No, and you can just put it into deploy it alongside your existing product, and no other component needs to be even touched. It just continues working. So, that is one of the biggest advantages of an async message processing architecture. Now, Let's say you 
your sales team uh, signs out a contract with some big enterprise user, special user. Whenever the user signs up, you have like a really special team you want to do for them, like maybe send a bouquet to the drone or something, right to their doorstep. Really special VIP customer. So, but you want that action to happen just as part of that customer. So, how do you do that? The first thing is, this is the format of the actual message or the topic that you are going to send the message of. Let's say you have something called as user or ad, which, which symbolizes what the actual action was. And let's say 500 was the department or the customer and there is the user that can add. Now, each of these services, which are common to all of them, is on user.app.start. So here I am introducing something called as the wildcard topic, which means that user.app.anything will be picked up by these services. Okay. Uh, wildcard topics are not something that you can do using HTTP as the transport here. So that user of HTTP will see how and what to do to enable wildcard topics. But we want wildcard topics in our architecture because uh, they give us a lot of easy. So all these things work. Now for our special VIP customer, that listens only for user dot add dot open, which is it's a customer ID, which means that if a message is sent for user dot add dot 420, a new user is added for say customer ID 420, only then will this VIP customer identifier pick it up and do whatever it wants to. Of course, the others will also pick it up because the others are staff and everything else will also happen, but there is this special action that we want. One big advantage is that you can enable these listeners for a particular sub topic. Like, they don't have to be decided at some point in the You can uh, create slots on the fly, you can remove slots on the fly. So imagine that this is not static at deployment time, but based on some logic, you can start listening to come and stop listening. Okay. Any questions about this? Now, another advantage of this, obviously, but this is common to all service oriented architectures, is function point scaling. Now, let's say that our push message notification uh, is one which consumes a lot of time, resources, or whatever, and we want to scale up this that part. All we have to do is increase the number of processes or increase the number of nodes on which this particular service is deployed. And automatically, our application scales up. But there is a problem here. Can anyone tell me what the problem is? If I just add nodes, what is going on? It's a topic. Everyone is going to consume the same. Right. So if you have 10, uh, 10 slots or 10 processes implementing a slot for a push mission multiplayer, all 10 of them are going to be invoked. And you will get 10 duplicate actions. So what is the solution to this? Distributor. Distributor. That's one option. Anything else? Introduce something called an exclusion group. So what an exclusion group does is for any particular message, only one of a given exclusion group receives that message. Okay. So it's not an, something like an active component. Basically, every uh, every process which is part of that slot receives that message, goes and tries to take a lock on this exclusion group for that message to be. Okay. Which obviously means that every message has some unique ID uh, which identifies that message. But every process which is part of the exclusion group will try and take a lock on the combination of the message ID and this exclusion group, whatever it is. This ensures that only one process among each of these 
will receive or act on one message. All of them will receive it, but only one of them will act on it. So it's more of a client searching rather than an active distributor component that you are adding to you. Remember, the more unique parts you add, the more difficult it gets to maintain. Now, let's say you want to scale this SMS notifier. All you do is deploy it, and the SMS notifier uh, uses a new exclusion group, let's say called SMS underscore ML. This means that whenever a message will come, one more out of the push MSG will receive it. Also, one more among the SMS notifier will receive it. Okay? Because the lock is on a combination of message ID and exclusion group. Okay. For SMS notifier, the exclusion group is different. So each one of the nodes in the SMS notifier service will try and take a walk on message ID plus SMS underscore message. Whereas the nodes in the push message notifier will try to take a walk on message ID plus push underscore message. Okay, so it's a different log than they are trying to take, and at least one of, or rather only one of, one exclusion group will act on one user. Okay, is this clear? Any questions? Okay. So, uh, all this is implemented in the Vimal library. So, okay, I will the Vimal library. So, Vimal is something that I started writing when. I saw and this is common patterns again and again. And there wasn't really any library available which captured these patterns that I wanted. Which was basically easy. A lot of distributor or microservice architecture libraries or whatever frameworks there are, all, almost all of them work on a request response kind of model, a standard RPC. Uh, none of them had this async capabilities, none of them gave me this exclusion group and all these capabilities that I wanted. And so I started writing this library called Gilmer. I started writing it in Ruby. Uh, now there are ports to Java and Golang as well. Uh, but we'll talk more about it later. So let's see some uh, most of the most all the code you see right now is from Ruby. Uh, if you don't really don't concentrate on the syntax, just uh, it's pretty readable. Uh, just concentrate on what you're trying to do. Is this readable? Okay. So for now, ignore the beta stuff. Look at Gilmer's law. User dot edit dot star, and the do and block has walk to do and this is what Over here, I'm just logging. This is a dummy example. So you are going to log send email notification. So hopefully, in your user submission, actually user submission. Uh, then you have the second Gilmer dot slot, user dot edit dot. And at the end, I am publishing a signal, the input of signal. Uh, that is the value of the message that I want. It's a tick or a hash or uh, hash map. And that is the topic that I want to publish. It is user dot add dot map. Both of these slots will take it out and it will uh, log send email notification for the and send push. Now, the waiters, so Gilmer is designed to be asynchronous by nature. This means that whenever you call Gilmer.slot, or a team of Gilmer.slot as a slot as a network of the Gilmer object, whenever you call Gilmer.slot, it's not going to block, it is going to go ahead. All this is doing is it is sort of registering a format. It is completely asynchronous. Think in terms of Ajax. A lot of us have done Ajax. So when you do Ajax or whatever, what should happen when the request comes back is the event of all that. So this is something very simple. Uh, because I want to wait till this entire thing is finished, uh, I introduce a waiter which is a facility provided by Gilmore. It's a synchronization mechanism by which uh, before doing something that you want to sync on, you just call add on it, waiter dot add. Uh, once you are done, you call waiter dot okay. And when the count drops to zero, add will just increment the count. Done will decrement the count. When the count drops to zero, waiter dot wait will 
Greater the range is a good thing. There's a tendency to send one go ahead till that comes to the top. And internally, it will handle it. Any questions? Uh, Sorry, okay. now the very box that you saw, the message uh, looked up, uh, we are using the redis for that. How many of you use the redis? Or are aware of what redis is? Uh, Redis is started off as a caching server. You can think of it as a um, data structure server. That's the best way I can think of it. If you want, if you have some data structures and you want to store them remotely, you can use Redis. It's very fast, it's very efficient. It's got the standard data structure operations. Uh, like if you have this append, you can uh, you can use it as a queue push call and stuff like that. What it is shared across multiple nodes. So it's like a shared data structure system. It also has a mechanism called PubSub, which is published subscribe. When you have subscribers, subscribers to a particular uh, topic, which is which can be verified or it can be a public topic, and uh, people publish to it. So internally, the more signal is going to publish after a bit of housekeeping, and the slot is actually with the subscribe. So it's more of a published subscribe. We, we have called enable backend Redis. Uh, currently, Redis is the only backend. There is partial support for Android MQ or AMQ, but uh, the Redis implementation is not available. So far, Redis has worked for whatever it is. Now, just talk about failure because that's a very important thing in, in the talking of that uh, So. You have this architecture, what happens if there's a failure in one of the models? So, what we do is we piggyback on the same signal pass mechanism to VLA failure. So, there is an error reporter component, and there's a special channel dedicated to the customer uh, on which, so, what, for example, when you uh, call this lock thing, right? Let's say if there's an error or an exception in the body of the slot that you're executing. It is automatically caught and an error message is automatically broadcast. So you don't really have to do anything exceptions are caught for you and the error message is not broadcast. Uh, there are so that's one way we do error reports. Now this was all uh async, but not everything can be modeled in async. Command response pattern. You send a command, you expect the response synchronously. So that is what we call request response or also called RPC. So we have two components. One component sends the command to you, and the second one responds. This is very basic. Now we want to build this request response on top of the AC thing that we have already built. To do that, to enable a reply what do we need? If this blue thing is, uh, is listening for commands, once it gets a command, it is to send the reply. What does it need to send the reply back? It needs to know where to send the response. It needs to know where to send the response. Which means that every message that you send must have a sender ID. Do we have a sender ID in the paper? Not every response is uh, successful uh, condition. You can have error conditions as part of the response. Okay. How do you differentiate between success and error? Very simple. You just add a code. So now our protocol is two things the sender ID and the code. Okay. So this is the payload structure of the That's it. Your actual data that you want to send, there is a sender which is automatically generated uh, in UID, and there is the response code. And that's it. So far, uh, right from when I started developing this mode, I have not had to add anything to this simple protocol. I have been tempted many times to add things like timestamps and stuff like that, but eventually I removed it and there was this 
So that is the protocol that Gmail has. I mean, it's very really stupid and simple. It's not really that simpler than that, but uh, a simpler to learn. Uh, what this also does is it allows me to inspect traffic on the web. So it's a simple JSON table. It's very easy to inspect. Traffic. So, you have seen request response pattern, you have seen async pattern. One big question is when to use what? When should you go for an async architecture? When should you go for a request response kind of architecture? And there is, uh, I mean, I have thought about this a lot. I have come up with one criteria to decide, and that is ownership of failure. If in the handling of the process something goes wrong, which component of the tool is responsible for acting on that field? You have to ask that question and that decides whether you will be async or a request response. If the caller is responsible for the failure, it has to be a request response. If the receiver is responsible for the failure, pay for async. So, you have seen two architectures, there is async and there is request response which is seen. So, how do you decide what to choose then? So, the criteria to decide it is figure out who owns the failure criteria. That means if something goes wrong in the processing of that message, who is responsible for the failure or who is going to act on the failure? So, the caller is going to act on the failure, then it is a request response. If the receiver or the person or the component which actually processes the message, that component is responsible for handling the failure or acting on the failure, then prefer an async file. Now, so far, if you've seen, uh, there are a lot of service oriented architecture libraries and stuff which talk about uh, things like error handling. In Gilmore, you stay away from error handling consciously. But what we do provide is error detection. Because uh, I've noticed that error handling is something that is very domain specific. And if you introduce some policy, like for example, uh, at a transport level, you introduce retries. Like if one does not acknowledge, you automatically retry to some other software. If you do that, then it is invading on the policy domain. That is something that is specific to your application. So, we will stay away from it. Uh, people can take their own decisions on what to do if there are errors, but we have mechanisms to detect them. For example, when you are making a request, you can pass in a flag, uh, actually, request does it on its own, or a confirmed subscriber. This means that it is going to check whether there is at least a single subscriber waiting for that particular topic on which you are going to publish a message. If that subscriber is not present, then you have to return error. The errors that we use in Gilmore are the same as the XPVP error. So, like, this, we don't have to think about what error you should return. Just look at the error, look at the custom message of the code, and return it. So, for example, this is written as 404. In the library implementation, you also have timeouts. You have client side timeouts as well as service side timeouts. Client side time also obvious because the service doesn't move on say five minutes at all. Service side time also are interesting. As a service, you know what is the upper limit uh, of time you should take for a particular operation. If something goes beyond that, then there's some problem. So you can set a timeout and the implementation uh, will send a response back, an error response back. Uh, that time Depending on the implementation, your execution may or may not get terminated. That's implementation specific. But the error response will be sent, and anything that you do after that will just vanish. I mean, any actual response that you send after a timeout is never going to leave the time. As far as the client is concerned, uh, it's a timeout. So, this is the error handling a bit. We saw a protocol for 
So this was, uh, I said that we do other reporting on top of AC. Uh, the question is what should be included or what should be the protocol for it? If you have a protocol defined for input and output, then it is, it is a must that you have a protocol also defined for error handling. Uh, the error protocol is actually used. Uh, a lot of this is taken care of by the implementation program that will fit in each of the things. Uh, most of them are uh, taken care of by the implementation, but the standard rule when you are uh, handling errors is to give out as much information as possible. One important thing that uh, is given is labor, which is not really part of error. Error. You can often have a chain of operations. Right? Once microservice calls another, that calls another, and anything can go wrong in this chain. But for debugging purposes, it would be nice if there is like, a unique ID that flows across the entire uh, command, like start to end. Uh, we thought a lot about putting this into the protocol itself, but we realized that it's not better than any application level, and different people will have different ways of doing it. Uh, the way we do it is uh, so, this is an example of an error notification. So, we use uh, user duty for any errors, user duty for service, to which you can send errors and you can define policies where you can find solution policies, policies, and it will uh, notify you on SMS or. Yes, dedicated features which are used back to the elements of What we have added in the application level data is something called as the request ID, which is carried through and through right to the end. Uh, this is the application level thing, it's not part of the demo. Uh, so, what I can do is I can take this request ID, for example, we have all our logs going into another service uh, where we can actually search those logs. I can search by the application ID and I can actually talk about the request ID and you can see everything that is. This brings us to a very important part of microservices which everyone is sort of ready about and that is the ops deployment of the uh, Gilmore as a library does a lot to just ease your deployment. Uh, that is something called a container mode wherein uh, you can build containers and deploy containers and Adding a new microservice is as simple as locking a file inside a uh, container directly on the screen. So, so you can redeploy in a round copy manner, which means that the entire service doesn't come down. One more can be redeployed, that is successful. And tested, you can go to the next one. So, so deployments are easy, but there are a few things that you have to do in the service or interactive. First is log forwarding. For a while, it takes any decent amount of load as multiple nodes. Going to every node and looking at the log is a big headache for you. So, have something that does log forwarding and release. Second, have some kind of centralized error reporting system. We did do this one, a few others would have built out the And monitoring is very tricky. These are at the server level, so we are talking about the node level. Every node must have these three things if you want to do the microservice application. This is an overhead. Uh, typically, people who practice microservice architecture as well distribute this overhead across teams, which means that every team is responsible for all three things. So they are responsible, responsible for the entire deployment of their service, and so they will take care of each one of these. There are also some things that you have to. Uh, be ready of at service level. And these these three things are whatever services in the system. So there should be a central place like a registry that these are the expected services or endpoints that have to be active. Once you have that, you can actually check whether does each of this service at a service level, not at a node level, have any spare capacity. Which 
means that if a new request is made, will that service be able to handle it or have I reached my quota? And do my services respond in time? Like you can have a very small ping uh, endpoint in every service. If that does not respond, say in five seconds or so, then uh, it's gone. Or there is in the Gilmore repositories, there is a component called as Gilmore Health Bulletin, which does do these two things. So if you require your uh, This is a typical error from an interest over issue from the help bulletin. It tells what topics are expected, what were not found. So, so, so far, Gilmore, it's a big recap. It's a library, it's not an external process. It's not a, so, there are a lot of micro service things that work as external processes through which you communicate and they will do something. So, uh, the is not that it's a library which is embedded inside your program. Uh, and every node which embeds the node becomes a Gilmore agent. It supports async, signal slots, it supports sync, request reply. There is a low level publish, uh, publish and subscribe, which I linked over here. You can do better combinations of requests and slots and stuff like that. Uh, in fact, the signal slots and request reply are built on top of publish and subscribe. You can have scaling by using exclusion groups, error and health monitoring, there's failure detection. There is no message persistence and there is no failure handling because we believe that that is best left to the button. Uh, we do recommend a library called Districts. Uh, it is built by Netflix, it's open source. Uh, it does all these three things or something. If you want these functionality, which you should be worried about, you are using a service oriented architecture, uh, map pressure management means that who is building up from the back, but the service that we're using uh, downstream is not really responding that fast. So, what we do in this case is uh, circuit breaking, which means that if uh, a downstream service goes offline, then there's no point doing anything. Like, you know you're going to fail. So, fail or do. So that is circuit breaking. Uh, there are queues. If there's a failure, you can put it into a retry queue and not use it. Maybe you can require for something after some time. And if there's a failure, then uh, or rather if the queue becomes too large, then you just ignore you know, what you So all these policies can be implemented using the resource library and you can use that on top of it. All this was about service oriented architecture. This is like uh, one of the real, almost any service oriented architecture that we talk or book that you read about. We talk about these things, these things, etc. Uh, a while ago, I came across uh, something on the web which was this what should you choose? Service oriented architecture or micro service architecture? And microservice architecture are service oriented architecture. This made no sense, and at that time I just talked about this software. But later on, I got a thought which sort of brought this back to me. And is there any other difference between service oriented architecture and micro service architecture? So, uh, I think at this point, the good logical point is to take about 15 minutes. Come back and see what the micro means in my I will take a 10 minute break and uh, this tea, coffee, and some snacks served at the back. So you can uh, take advantage of that. There's a restroom on your right, so you can take. So, quick 10 minutes break.
taking a ten, quick 10 minutes break.
It's not on for you. It's on. You want that? Can you hold it? Me or? Is, uh, Uh, what I have tried to do is incorporate these features 
in the business so that you can write smaller services and you can use these smaller services much you know very easily. So the Dimmar version of microservices is basically the Linux philosophy applied to service oriented so the first thing about writing small programs and connecting them to each other. So uh, what we have is we have a standard input, we have a standard input, that's a standard input and output channel is what you see in the request and response uh, matter. And we have a dedicated error channel to which to do errors. Okay. So the error reporting and uh, the input output part is not already uh, taken care of that one. The second and the more interesting part is service composition. These are the things that you can do on a Unix shell. You can have command 1, 5 to command 2, 5 to command 3. How many of you have worked on the Unix system? How many have not worked on the Unix system? Okay, so in Unix, okay, I'm going to Unix right now, but uh, definitely you look at it up. Uh, if you have never done it before, at least. Uh, get some uh, data hands on some little box or something and just try out the issue. Then you can do command 1, and then command 2, and then command 3. You can also do batching, command 1, semicolon, command 2, semicolon, command 3. In this case, uh, the output of each of these commands is not really uh, You just want to do it sequentially. What you can also do is group them, which means that uh, command 1. One command, and the output of all of them is put into a like it's combined. There's no under the command one will be run, the output will go into a command two will be run, the output will go into a and so on. This arrow and C, which are IO, which is not really part of uh, traditional units, means that if you want to execute three operations in parallel, but wait for all three to finish at the end. So those three parallel operations form a logical entity, and you want to wait for those together. So these are the ways you can compose smaller programs or smaller services and make a larger service. So Dilmar actually supports all these patterns. You can compose services, you can uh, compose this actual Unix file as well. There's uh, a method called and and there's batch and this parallel system. So let's take an example. Uh, this is an example from my uh, current product. I've dumped it down a bit. Uh, let's take a look at what it is. The idea is that you want to bring up uh, some infrastructure for a new customer that is just on the So what you want to do is you want to bring up a data center, DC center, data center, data center, data center, data center. The output of that you want to validate whether the data center will go up there. Once that is done, the output of that is that thing, I want to give to a parallel operation. That parallel operation consists of two things. The first thing is it brings up some logging service for that particular customer. The second is that it brings up a monitoring service for that particular customer. The bring up of a bring up monitor, bring up DC, and both the validates are individual microservices. So each one of them has been developed independently. It can be in a different angle, it can be done by different tools, different people, uh, different things. Now the question is how do you construct this kind of composition and you have code? So this is all the code actually looks like. You create a data center operation pipeline, DC pipeline, and that is this ponder of compose, okay, which is what we are doing. The pipe maps to the composer. So, bring up DC pipe to validate. That is equivalent to private dot customer dot data center dot create. That's the part which brings up the data center. And I'm piping that to data center dot validate. Okay, so the output of the first microservice is going to go as input to the other. So the output of the data center is going to go as input to the validation. Now, now the second pipeline 
can use the pipeline which constructs the logging and monitoring nodes. So I want to bring up those two nodes in parallel, the engineer, the monitor, and the logger in parallel. Once that is done, I want to combine the outputs. So if you see this uh, line number 14 is actually the equivalent of a lambda. It's a piece of code which is going to run in place. It's not going to be distributed, it's just a piece of code. So, the, so you can inject lambdas in this composition as well. So along with actually uploading your work to another microservice, the output of that can be processed to a lambda, which you can get. It can be a so basically, this camera is just massaging the output, collating it together because uh, the parallel uh, is thing is gives two different options. I just want to combine them. So all that the camera is doing is combining them into something like that. Uh, the last is value. So the output, the combined output of uh, logger and monitor create is going through a validation service, which is going to validate whether all of them. Uh, having both of them. Now, if at any stage this pipeline fails, the entire pipeline is going to fail with that. So, uh, we do understand the responders are sync. Now, remember, all these responders are parallel controls, all these are async calls. They are not going to block. They are just constructing the pipeline. If you want to block, that means uh, beyond line number 18, the flow should not proceed beyond that. Uh, till the entire operation is complete, you have to wrap it in responder.c. So I say responder.c and compose it to two pipelines. Okay. So it's no longer just composition of microservices. This can be nested to any level that you want. So when you define uh, the most pipeline, for example, can be arbitrarily good. You can do whatever it wants. That pipeline can become a part of another composition. Right? So there's no Limit to which you can go and compose your pipeline. So I'm composing the DC pipeline and the nose pipeline, which means that the output of the DC pipeline is going to be the input of the nose pipeline. And the DC pipeline itself is a composition, the nose pipeline itself is a composition. So you can compose it only. And that is how you can compose the services. And the output uh, you get at the end. So uh, the output of C is to get data and code, which is the final data and code, which will in effect be the output of uh, line number the service corresponding to corresponding to line number 50. So that's the last step is going to be So if that becomes success, it means that your entire operation works successfully. Okay. So I'll just leave this for almost 15 seconds, then people can use them. I have not used and then over here. What and that does is uh, it does not pass the input of one to the other, it just checks for the status quo. If the status quo is success, only then it will execute that. So it's like saying execute the first one view, uh, execute the second one view to full space. And this is actually like working for the end of data center. It's not I'm just going to switch to a demo, which for the technique I'm going to do. So, uh, this code that I showed you, I'm going to show you. So, this branch I've just done down the code. So the same code that I showed in this slide. These are just like service wrappers that run. So uh, the VS response, what it does is underneath uh, <laughs> is going to call uh, the reply to, uh, which is going to register for that particular model. But uh, it just encapsulates uh, input and text. When you get the request, it starts executing it to the screen that you want the request, and once it is done, it will print out. 
the list of adapter that will fall inside this list from the previous printing before and after. And these are the services that have uh, commented out the actual operation because we have an internet and even if I will have it uh, like time to bring over or PPC and stuff over here to see. So we just come that out and put in dummy return. Okay. So I have two uh, microservice containers that are running, both are running the same code. So I have two instances of it running on my own machine that I have to do. And I'm going to run a command to bring up uh, the customer data center and to see if it's about customer infrastructure. So manager the target is the plan to send the message out and use the business. So customer create and I give the UID for a few. Now when I run it, <coughs> you see that the operations are actually distributed across the two. Uh, okay. So the create customer went to the right one, that was the entry point. Okay. That should have on the data center create is also into the right hand side one. Uh, after the data center, one of the validates should have been called. So the logger create went to the left one, the monitor create went to the left one, and the validate again went to the right one. So you can't predict what was left. That's why you need all that monitoring and work uh, forwarding and navigation. Uh, let's try and run it again and see whether it's good. Yeah, so now this thing the primary data center created went to the left. So, you are on the right. So, as you can see, it's like completely arbitrary. Uh, at the end, you will get status 200. So this is the tool that is now to get the over Okay, so any questions about this? Another typically one stay ID. Like if one is loaded or not, then maybe all the others will do. So, no, that usually is not So, uh, everyone is looking for, so as I said, uh, these clients are working on an exclusion group, which means all of them get the messages, but you will not get the wrong first to them. So, it's purely a function of load. So, the node which has lesser load has a higher chance of picking up the load. So in that sense, it automatically there's some kind of load issue. So, for example, in this response of what's seen, uh, because I have a compose, the first error that you get will invoke a handler that is being passed with the error code that was sent by whatever. There is actually a third argument that is passed over there which is not included for simplicity sake, and that is the continuation, which means that if you lay out the entire operation as a tree, right? Uh, for a particular operation that is executing, there is a concept of rest of the pending operations. Okay. That rest of the pending operations is wrapped up inside the demo pipeline and passed as the third argument. Which means that if a particular pipeline fails at any given stage, we can do any cleanup or whatever and you can continue with the rest of the operation also. Or you can completely retract on the way. No, so the, uh, the job of 
doing no operations to hold that. They are coming to you. They are telling you what to do. For example, if you create a VPC in customer here, and after that, it tells you something new to revert back and delete the details. So, So over here if you see there is result data and result code, line number 18 of the end. And I'm putting uh in dollar STR as risk code and as data. So if any of those operations does not return a 200, which is a success, uh, this block will be immediately called. So the entire pipeline was immediately on failure. The whole thing proceed ahead, and this block will be called at the failure point with whatever error code was returned on the last one. So when I'm doing STDR or QTS, whatever, in my actual production code there is failure in the like if code not equal to 200, do some cleanup and stuff. Is that something? Any more So yeah, a quick recap. Uh, as I said, most of the points. Uh, that is saw earlier, the only addition now is that we have composition and you can really call them micro solutions. You can actually write very, very small solutions which communicate and interact with each other. Uh, there are three languages in which this has been implemented. These are the because Ruby is like the reference implementation. That's where I implement any feature first, and that's the most advanced in terms of available features. Uh, there's one feature called NICE, which, which is used to interact with the speech library that I've uh, What NICE does is exactly similar to the Unix NICE. Uh, what it does is it induces a delay in version of a lot in the message box. So that the higher the NICE value of a particular handle, uh, the less lower it will take. Because other will get the wrong thing. So, there's a high mode on a particular machine or a particular mode, you can use nice to sort of automatically do some work. It's a very simple mechanism to do load balancing, but it's The job, so these are the URLs. Uh, it's on GitHub, it's open source, community license, is what you want to do. Uh, there's a Java port, there's a uh, GoLang port. These are not, okay, for example, the request to plan. So actually these don't have the composition feature that I just explained. So that needs to be implemented. Uh, they will be implemented however uh, I can do that. Uh, one thing I would like to say is if any, any one of you is interested in uh, contributing to the Java and or even the Ruby ports, uh, please feel free to uh, go to the URL, check out the code and ask questions to them, create issues. I am not uh, a very good, a very experienced Java developer. My son took over Java development for like one and a half months in my entire life. So, and half of that has written demo, so I don't exactly know how good it is. So, if any of you are a good experienced Java programmer, please take a look and give me feedback and even go ahead and implement the application. Same goes with you. Uh, one thing that we are coming up is since we have taken inspiration from Unix, we will go, have to go back to Unix and create a command line client which we can use this way on the Unix command. And if you can do that at the service level, obviously you should be able to do that on the Unix command. So this will enable you to actually interact with services using the Unix command. So this is a obvious. So uh, we follow, like, I think it is two of us, but we still follow a process where Submit a proposal, you think over it, or how uh, the interface should be. I think this is the proposal. We're still fine tuning how uh, we should be. Uh, and yeah, that's it. Uh, big thanks to the local Ruby community because we gave them a lot of feedback and patiently uh, listened to all the nonsense I threw at them while they were implementing this. You should have now with a second contributor, major contributor. And it has been for giving me time to work on this and to do using this in production. Okay. Any questions? Thank you.
Thank you.